I think we're just about at time. So I'm just going to go ahead and go. And uh, hopefully there's no too late stragglers. Um, they'll miss out on the important things like, well, not really, uh, important things like about me. Uh, so I'm Jason. Welcome. This is 100% observability. I'm a technical writer and evangelist at Datadog. I do docs and talks is how I shorten that, so documentation, and I travel and talk. I'm also a DevOps Days organizer, so I help with the global team, uh, as well as I help organize DevOps Days Portland. So if you're into DevOps, uh, you should definitely check out your local DevOps Days event. Uh, I've also been a DrupalCon track chair for a while, so I help select sessions uh, for this conference. Hopefully you've enjoyed them. Uh, I'm also a travel hacker, so I get on planes and fly around to really nowhere in particular, just for miles. And then occasionally when I do get off and visit places, I like to find interesting whiskey. Uh, on Twitter, I'm git bisect. Uh, I also have an email, jason.e at datadoghq. If at any time, even after this, you think of a question and you're like, I wonder about that, feel free to email me or tweet at me. Um, also, if you are in the keynote this morning and you stayed through Q&A, um, I might also be known as Preston So or David Huang. Um, so you can tweet at them also. It's at Preston So and at Eatings, E-A-T-I-N-G-S. Feel free to just tweet at them about this session, about how great you thought they were. Um, that'd be amazing. Uh, is, have people heard of Datadog? Just quick show of hands. Anybody, just a few people. Cool. Um, so for those who haven't, Datadog is a SaaS-based monitoring platform. Give you an idea of the scale of what we handle. We do 15 million data points per second, uh, which comes to over a trillion data points per day. So we do a lot of monitoring for a lot of people. Uh, we have open source clients and libraries and a bunch of other cool stuff. I do have to do the thing that we are hiring. Uh, we don't do any Drupal. But if you're in ops or you're looking for really cool challenges, handling tons of data, we're hiring all over the place for all sorts of positions, SREs, ops people, front end devs, um, things like that. So definitely check out that, that link if you're interested in a new job. And it's Datadog HQ on Twitter, not Datadog. Datadog is a black Labrador retriever who will make fun of you if you tweet at Datadog. So again, don't tweet at Datadog. Tweet at, at Preston So or at Eatings and tell them how great this session is. Uh, at Datadog, one of the things with monitoring is you want a lot of integrations, and we have a whole ton of stuff, simply because if you're involved in any sort of tech, even like Drupal related, we're, we all face this, right? There's just so much tech out there. You can go down to the expo hall and you'll meet a bunch of these people, uh, but there's an explosion of stuff that's going on. We live in this fantastic uh, period of time in tech where Everyone's creating really cool stuff. And that comes to monitoring as well, right? So when we think of all the things that are out there, how we can monitor our systems and our websites and applications, there's just a ton of stuff. And if you talk to any of the vendors, they'll tell you that they monitor it all and you just need their thing and you should just pay them money. Uh, or if you're involved in open source, then you, you have all these tools and you're like, what do I need to put together? So that's essentially why I wrote this talk, right? There's just too much. So let's try to make some sense of the monitoring systems out there, whether they're services, whether they're open source, so that we, we can actually get some full coverage. But before we do, we really ought to talk about how we should think about metrics and the, you know, what do we need to be gathering? How do we need to think about the data that we're gathering? And there's really four good qualities of metrics that you should keep in mind. The first of those is that they have to be well understood. Obviously, if I understand a metric and you don't understand it, or someone else in our organization doesn't understand it, then it's completely useless. A great example of this uh, is the Mars Orbiter. Uh, I love this example. Is anyone familiar with the Mars Orbiter? Yeah, I saw one hand. Uh, the Mars Orbiter, for those who don't know, isn't more orbiting Mars. So the Mars Orbiter was created in collaboration between NASA and Lockheed Martin. NASA traditionally uses uh, metric numbers, things like kilograms, uh, kilometers, things like that. And Lockheed Martin, being an American tr company, traditionally uses imperial numbers, so miles, pounds, feet, inches, numbers like that. Nobody bothered marking what units things were on one of their orbital calculations. Everyone just assumed they were all on the same page. Um, obviously, their data was not well understood because the Mars orbiter has crashed into Mars. 
Uh, so it's very key to understand that what sort of metrics you're using, what sort of numbers you're using, get everybody on the same page. And as we dive into some of the monitoring solutions out there, this will come up and be one of the ways that we evaluate things. The second is that your metrics need to be sufficiently granular. So I love this. This is from the Olympics. Uh, I guess that was last year uh, down in Rio. This is the, the, some of the numbers from the medal uh, race for the men's 50 meter freestyle. It's, it's really cool. I enjoy it because it's super fast. And as we can see, hopefully those numbers aren't too cut off on the screen. But everybody except for the last guy did it in 21 seconds. So if whole seconds are our granularity, then this is the Special Olympics, everybody wins, right? We understand intrinsically that granularity matters. So for the Olympics, we do it 200th of a second. Uh, and so there are, there's one tie here. Uh, there was a tie for sixth place. But similarly with the metrics that we gather, and as we talk about this different things that we need to monitor, our granularity will matter significantly depending on what we're talking about. So keeping in mind that we need things to be sufficiently granular for what we desire to get out of them. The third property that we need from all our, our metrics is that they have to be tagged and filterable. Tagged and fil filterable, the, the important thing here is if we're generating a lot of data, uh, even not at the level of data dog, you know, of trillions of data points a day, but you are all generating a ton of data. You're generating more data than you ever have before. And that metric data, you need to be able to make sense of it. And one way is tagging and filtering. And we'll see later how this becomes important. But generally, the idea is if you don't have that metadata around the metrics that you're gathering, then it's going to be much less useful. And then finally is that your metrics need to be long-lived. So as you think about your metrics collection, you need to be thinking about how long you need to store things. Storing things has different properties. A lot of times you're storing things to find trends. Uh, oftentimes you're storing things so you can have a historical reference. Sometimes you're storing things because computers need that history as well so that they can start to make some predictions. So we'll dive into that a little bit later as well. So with those four key properties of being uh, well understood, sufficiently granular, tagged and filterable, and long-lived, let's try to make sense of some of this craziness that we have and the way that I like to do that is to start to think of our application stack, right? Let's think of the things that we run, the technology that we run that makes up an application. So obviously, if we're, if we're drilling down, it starts with the client. It's our end users. How do they interact with our Drupal sites or our applications? You know, earlier this morning in the keynote, we saw Dries talk about voice communications, right? Being able to have a chat bot into Drupal or being able to have a, you know, a, like an Alexa uh, voice kind of skill into Drupal. So we need to think about how do we monitor what we would consider the client side. And then we're all here at DrupalCon, so we're very familiar with applications like Drupal, things that run tr traditionally as backend code or applications on servers. That's pretty straightforward if we think of applications. And then finally, the infrastructure. And infrastructure is really great. I love the age that we're in now because infrastructure is getting totally crazy. Uh, you obviously have things like hosted cloud providers, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft Azure, but then you've got cool things like Docker uh, and Kubernetes and Mesos that run containers. So we have to start thinking again about our app infrastructure and how do we monitor these, these things that have become ephemeral where we can spin them up and tear them down and scale them. But one of the, the problems of when we think of things in our traditional stacks or think of them in these buckets, is we tend to miss out, and we tend to not see really where these edges are, or we miss things because we're defining these edges, and we, really we ought to be thinking of it less as an application stack and more of as a spectrum. Your end users, when they interact with your application, they don't see a stack. They interact with you as a company, and that goes from all the way in the front end, whatever they're clicking on, all the way down to the infrastructure, and they don't care which portion it is or which team uh, is responsible for that, they really care that it just works and that it works well. So if we think of things as an application spectrum, it allows us to start to see where things blur. Uh, and it really helps us when we're choosing monitoring solutions because monitoring has a lot of overlaps. So when a vendor or an open source project says that they monitor something, 
If you think of things as a spectrum, it becomes much clearer to see where that monitoring ends and where you need to start filling in those gaps. So the five areas that we're going to be covering for monitoring, uh, the three that are traditionally thought of on the front end, uh, the first is going to be what's traditionally known as performance monitoring. Traditionally, this has two main sections. One's called synthetics, and the other's called RUM. And RUM stands for real user monitoring. As we transition across the spectrum into the application side, we traditionally call this application monitoring, suitable since it's monitoring applications, but there's two traditional parts with this as well. One's traditionally called APM, or application performance monitoring, and the other's just known as application monitoring. And then finally, as we tr transition all the way back into their, our infrastructure, again, very suitable name, infrastructure monitoring is what infrastructure monitoring is called. Uh, but again, as we start to think of these three groups within monitoring, understanding that there are these overlaps and understanding things like if we're talking about an application and monitoring an application, you do have applications now that are running on the front end, right? That you push code to them and a lot of the, the code is being executed in JavaScript in their browser. Or similarly, when we're thinking of infrastructure, we have that blurry line of if you're running in AWS and you've moved off of MySQL and you're using Amazon's RDS, well, is that infrastructure or is that an application, right? It could be both in those cases. So understanding that we have these gray lines on our spectrum where we can start to have fuzzy areas, but knowing that we need to be aware of those when we monitor. So with all of that, let's dive into the infrastructure side. Why is infrastructure monitoring important? Well, obviously you need it because your application needs to run. It needs some sort of infrastructure. Even if you have bought into the whole serverless thing, serverless is just someone else's server, right? It still runs on a server. So you need that infrastructure. But more importantly than that, we, we need infrastructure because, and we need to monitor it because downtime costs us money. And we all inherently know this, that when our applications go down, it costs our company money, whether that's actual money in sales or whether that's money in donations or just money in PR branding type things. For a little idea of how much money though this costs us, well, if you're huge and you're like Amazon, uh, Amazon went down uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and they were down for 20 minutes. It cost them a whole three and three quarters of a million dollars. So that's one end of the, the spectrum. It's huge, that's a ton of money, but even thinking about like Fortune 1000 companies. So what the places that we would consider your, your average enterprise, IDC did a survey of the Fortune 1000 and they found that the average cost of uh, an hour of infrastructure failure was $100,000. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm a travel hacker, so I'm really interested in aviation things. Uh, this was an interesting one. Earlier in January, Delta had an outage on a Sunday night. They had to cancel about 170 flights. It cost them eight and a half million dollars, and this was due to a system outage. But more interestingly, and this is a little washed out, but hopefully you can see that, more than the eight and a half million dollars that they lost, uh, their stock went down Monday morning, instantly just dropped off two points. Uh, which this represents more than just the, the revenues lost. This was tens of millions of dollars uh, on their part. So there is a cost, not just financial, to the things that we, you know, when we have an outage, it's not just the lost sales. We have to start thinking about the actual cost to our companies and their reputations. The benefits, though, the benefits of monitoring, why do we do this? Well, as G.I. Joe says, knowing is half the battle, right? Decreased mean time de detection is really what we're after here. Getting faster, getting faster at our jobs, getting faster at putting things back up when they, when they fail. And then also, not only the, just the detection, but getting that information that we need in order to speed our recovery. Because if you can detect things, and potentially if you can actually detect things before they happen, you can avoid them. So let's dive into, let's take those four uh, qualities of metrics and start to consider them as we, we look at to infrastructure monitoring. So the first that I mentioned was they have to be well understood. So there's this ease of sharing information. Uh, if we have infrastructure monitoring, well understood means does it integrate with the tools we already use, right? So if we're implementing some sort of monitoring tool, does it integrate with our chat ops tool? 
Slack, HipChat, whatever we're using, even IRC if we're still using that. Can we actually send out automated messages so that people understand things? Also, there's the ease of deployment and use. Simply, can people log in? Can people make the dashboards that they need? If you're not able to make the dashboards that you need, if you're not able to get the alerts, then similar to having metric and imperial numbers and people being completely disconnected and not understanding things, people don't have that information, they're gonna be disconnected. So, as I mentioned, integrations. But aside from the integrations like applications that you need, also consider things like the integrations with your infrastructure. As you're starting to move to maybe things like hybrid clouds or hosted clouds, how do those work with the traditional servers that you've been running? Can you monitor all of those? Can you monitor virtual servers or containers? And can we bring them all into one place? It's so easy for us to set up things, and I know people love to set up open source tools, so someone sets up a, a Nagio server and they're monitoring something, but how does that play with all the other monitoring that you've got? So try to bring everything all into one place. So that was being well understood. Being sufficiently granular here is really crucial, especially as you're moving to hosted services. When you're hosted, it's often really difficult to adjust these for yourself. So if you're looking at hosting on popular public clouds, if you're looking at CloudWatch for, from Amazon, you're gonna get one minute granularity, similar with, with Google Stackdriver. If you're looking at Amazon or Microsoft Azure, uh, you get one minute, but that's only up to 24 hours. So as you think of the granularity that you need, and you think of maybe having a one minute outage on the weekend, and then coming back and trying to check in on Monday morning, well, with Azure, that's completely gone because it rolls up into one hour. And so you're down for 1 60th of the time now, uh, which essentially means you'll never actually see that. That comes to play when we think of the dashboarding tools that we use. So this is just a simple graph showing a CPU spike. And we can see the top is in one second granularity. It's really hard to see the, the peak there, but if you were to zoom in, the total uh, spike there is 46.7% or thereabouts. And we can see where that actual spike is. When we roll that up to one minute, we can see that that, that spike has now shifted to the beginning of the minute. But more than that, and again, it's hard to see, but off to the, the left of it, we can see the scale. And at this point, it's only peaking because it's been rolled up into one minute. It's only peaking at about 36%. So now our, our peak is much less. And then when we roll up to five minutes, not only has that, that spike shifted all the way to the start of our five minute allotment, but it's only peaking at like 11%. Uh, so when we roll things up, not only is it just about losing information, uh, there's a sense that because the time is shifting here and because the level of the spike is being aggregated, we're not just losing information, we're starting to receive false data. So having that granularity isn't just about seeing what you need, but it's seeing the accurate information that you need. So part three of our good qualities is that we need to have th metrics that are tagged and filterable. So the main advantage is on the infrastructure side of being cloud-based and having things, things like containers or virtual machines is the ease that we get of scaling and distributing, right? So when we move to Amazon, it's really easy to have geo-distributed things in different availability zones, different regions of the world. But the problem with that is that it generates all this useful metadata, and if we're not capturing that, if we're not tagging our metrics with where they came from, what region of the world, uh, what size of machine they were on, then we're losing a lot of that useful data to know in the future to help us understand our data and understand where our problems are, whether they're happening happening in a specific part of the world, or if they're happening, say, on a specific type of server or a specific uh, size of server. So when you think about our metrics on the infrastructure side, we really need to think of them not only as the what is it and the how much, and obviously the timestamp of when it happened, but we need these tags of where it happened, uh, where it happened, what type of system it happened on. And that allows us to start thinking of our metrics less of as here's a metric, we just need to put it into a dashboard and hopefully we can see it, but actually turn it into something that we can query, almost like a database. So rather than looking at something, we can query against it and say, show me all of the information from 
my Apache server that's running on, if we're in Amazon, uh, you know, a, an Amazon large instance, let's say in US East 1A, uh, that's running my Drupal application versus the a Apache that's running maybe a WordPress. So as we start to do this, we can start to ask these questions and, and hone things down, and it allows us to see patterns and trends and things like that. Speaking of patterns and trends, keeping your information around for a long time. So that, again, back to our qualities, number four is long-lived. So if we're thinking of hosting, again, on things like public cloud, well, when we're doing the monitoring and retaining these metrics, if we're using Amazon CloudWatch, they're the industry leader at 15 months. But similar to the way that Azure rolled up their metrics, uh, Amazon does that for their, their retention. So they won't retain all of your data past 15 days, they'll start to roll it up into five minute increments and then into one hour increments. Uh, which is still better, because they keep things around for 15 months compared to Google Stack Driver, which you only have six weeks, or Azure, which is 90 days, so about three months. So start to think about how long you should be keeping your data in order to see trends. 15 months is fantastic if you can actually keep things. Uh, and 15 months, for those that don't understand why 15 months, because it seems like an odd number, it's a year and a quarter, because oftentimes we see patterns that go on quarters. So not only keeping a year to see year over year trends, but keeping things so you can actually see quarter over quarter trends. So I've talked a lot about how we should be considering uh, monitoring our infrastructure. Well, a lot of people are wondering, OK, well, what should I use for monitoring? There are a ton of projects out there, uh, particularly in the open source world. So we've got things like uh, Nagios, or Nagios, you can pronounce it either way, I guess, uh, or Ichinga, which is the, the newer version of that. Uh, Sensu is getting really popular. Sensu is essentially taking Nagios's idea and modernizing it for modern infrastructure. If you're interested in that, actually, uh, Howard Tyson has a session right after this at 5 PM, a couple doors down. Uh, Prometheus is another super popular one. But you have to understand with all of these that with open source, you're putting together parts in a very similar way that you are with Drupal modules. And you have to connect a bunch of modules and configure them and put them all together so they work right. Uh, if you're running Prometheus, it's largely gathering data for you. And you have to understand the nuances of things like the open source projects that you're using. So for example, Prometheus uh, is fantastic, but it stores one file per uh, time series metric type. So Every single metric that you gather has a file. And if you can imagine storing everything into one file, well, over time that grows. So Prometheus, they don't re recommend you that you retain your data for a long time. They recommend that you actually put it into something like IronDB or another tool, which actually is designed for longer retention. So understanding similarly in the ways that we evaluate Drupal modules, you have to evaluate your open source projects, understand what they're good at, what they were intended for, and marry them with things that sort of fill in those, those gaps of things that it doesn't do. Uh, obviously, I work for Datadog, so if you're thinking more on the, the SaaS or PaaS side, something that's hosted for you, Datadog's fantastic, uh, but I'm not gonna turn this into an infomercial. CloudWatch, if you're running on Amazon, they do a great job. They do have some missing spots, but for the large part, you know, it's a good, cheap service. So we covered infrastructure. Let's talk a little bit about application monitoring, the things that run over on our infrastructure. So why is it important? Obviously, the applications that we run are important to our businesses. They're how our businesses make money. They're how our businesses get known. Uh, we already know that downtime costs money, and I threw some stats at you for that. But as we start thinking of application, we also know that slow performance costs us money. So we need to start considering that. So as I mentioned, there's two types under application monitoring. One is just straight up application monitoring. And the benefits here are that we've all built custom apps, right? That's the whole point behind Drupal, is to build custom applications, web applications. But we also, a lot of us build other applications. So we need to start gathering custom metrics from these applications and understanding how well we're doing on a business level. And then also within application monitoring, monitoring the applications that we didn't write. So if we're running Drupal, how is MySQL doing? Are we gathering metrics from MySQL? If we're running uh, Nginx or if we're running Varnish out front uh, as a load balancer or a, a reverse proxy, how, are, how is that performing? 
So again, diving into those, those four key qualities, well understood. So if we're thinking about application monitoring, largely we're gonna be dealing with some sort of SDK, some sort of library on the code that we're writing. So how do we integrate the code that we're writing into it? Or if we are using other applications like MySQL or Nginx or Varnish, how do those integrate with it? So well understood in this case for application monitoring means how well documented is it? Is there an API, is there an SDK that allows me to get up and running really quickly? And then how many integrations does it have, right? If we're talking about something that's well understood, it should have a good community, it should have a good base. If I want to run some other application, hopefully there's a lot of integration so I don't have to write that myself. And then as we think of the other three qualities, is it sufficiently granular? So for our applications, depending on what's, what sort of granularity we're running, we probably still want second, or maybe we want to start diving into sub-second granularity. So second granularity here is really good. So if we're running MySQL, how many queries per second are we running? But maybe we want that sub-second. We want to know how long a query lasts. What's the latency on a query? So usually queries are measured in things like milliseconds. Tagged and filterable, again, super important here. If we're running MySQL and it's been broken out into uh, master-slave or primary-secondary, we want to know if we're having reads from a bunch of different MySQLs, which one did it come from? Which MySQL server was that from? Or if we're load balancing with Nginx and it's diverting things to a particular web server, which one is it coming from? What size is it? What's the metadata on that server so that we can start to understand what's going on? And then long-lived, again, to start to see those trends on what we're, how we're performing over time and what our systems are doing over time. Uh, so examples in this. There are, again, a lot of examples. Typically, application and infrastructure monitoring do overlap. So all of the things that I mentioned on the open source side before, things like Nagios, things like Prometheus, they can monitor some of your applications. But again, you're, you're going to have to piece together a lot of this. So you, you often have to install some sort of collector, marry that with some sort of time series database to actually ingest your data, marry that to a dashboarding tool and then to some alerting tool to actually let you know when something's going wrong. Um, there are a bunch of standards in how metrics are generated. Uh, the formats typically, the, there are two main ones, CollectD and StatsD are the really popular ones. Uh, at Datadog, we use StatsD or a modified version of it. There is a Drupal project out there if you are thinking of sending metrics from Drupal directly as uh, you know, application metrics to some sort of application monitoring tool, you can use the Drupal StatsD project. And again, popular services here are really gonna be the same. So at Datadog, we do it, of course. CloudWatch does it. Most any of your application monitoring companies will be the same as your infrastructure monitoring companies. But again, consider how many integrations they have because you don't want to be writing all of those. The other one within application that I mentioned is APM or application, application performance monitoring. And so here we need to talk about the cost of slow performance. Um, and the graphic there is how I feel when, how most of us feel when we hit a, a site and it's just super slow. And statistics prove it. Uh, the permanent abandonment rate for a slow site is 28%. So people that hit a site that's actually slow will never come back, a quarter of them will never come back compared to only 9% for an outage, which essentially means if your website goes down, it's far better than just having a slow website. Uh, Walmart.com did a study for every 100 milliseconds that they improved on their page load time, it grew their revenue 1%. So making things faster makes you more money. Google and Bing essentially did the reverse study. They started to intentionally slow down their search sites, uh, and they found that they lost about 3% of revenue uh, for every one second of delay. So that's why APM is important. We want to monitor the performance and, again, how that impacts our revenue. But similarly, one thing that a lot of people don't consider when they're thinking of an APM is there's an impact to your cost, particularly if you're thinking of hosting on some sort of public cloud. When you buy time from AWS, you're buying CPU time which means that if you're running code that's taking a long time, that's not optimized, not only are you losing money from your site being slow, but you're losing money because you're spending a lot of money in order to run those. 
The other interesting thing is that optimized code has a correlation to less defects or bugs. And that's, in, and we all kind of feel that as common sense. If we write good code, there's not gonna be a whole lot of bugs in it and it'll be faster. Uh, there is an interesting session on Thursday, uh, which I, you know, I haven't met this guy, uh, but it looked really cool. So I'm gonna try to check it out. Hopefully you will as well. Um, Joseph Purcell on Thursday morning has one on code quality and he's gonna talk a little bit about um, essentially how to optimize your code. So as we dive back into our four key qualities of metrics, well understood. Well for APMs, well understood does mean, well understood means does it understand the languages that we write in. So for Drupal that's PHP, but if we're writing in other things, does it support that? And more and more we're all moving to be polyglots. We're writing applications and services in languages that best suit them. So does it support the languages that I have now, but can it support other languages that I might shift into? And then more and more with other languages, not so much again PHP, but does it handle asynchronous languages? So if we're starting to write things in Go, or if we're starting to write things, uh, Python 3 has Python async IO, can it handle these asynchronous uh, transactions and asynchronous runs where things are starting to spin off concurrent processes? Again, does this integrate with other applications? This one's a little bit different from your traditional application monitoring where you're gonna be rec receiving metrics from something like MySQL or Varnish. But with this, on APM side, we wanna know does it integrate, can it actually see what my queries are against a database and start to track those so we can see the latency and how our slow queries are affecting our, our actual code or things like our caches. So if something is in cache or not in cache, we want to understand how that makes our code slow or more performant. And then finally, how easy is it to integrate? Because nobody wants to go and have to modify all their code to insert all of these lines to trace their code and to figure out the performance of their code. So does it work with the frameworks that we're using? Sufficiently granular in this sense? Uh, almost every APM uses some second timers. If you find one that doesn't, you should run away quickly, like that's just ludicrous because code operates that fast. But when it comes to sufficiently granular, we really want to understand how our APMs sample things. So with APMs, you should be running them on your production systems. You're not just running it in dev, test, or on your local machine. You want to run and have real users hitting your systems and figuring out what the performance of your actual sites are doing. But in order to do that, it means that you're gonna have a slight performance hit, right? Because now you're running a little bit of ad additional code on top of that. So we need to understand, number one, that it shouldn't negatively impact our customers because that's the whole problem that we're si trying to solve with this. But in order to do that, we need to sample. So we want it to sample and only run on a certain number of our users' uh, sessions when they're actually interacting with our applications or our sites. In order to do that, sufficient granularity here means that we have to have statistically sound models. So you can't just be gathering the metrics for when something fails or when something is slow. Uh, you wanna collect everything that you can so you can understand the, your latency distribution and not just your extremes or your averages. Tagged and filterable, again, does it handle distributed environments? As we move to more and more distributed things, when we're starting to run an APM and it's tracing our code, if our code is jumping from one server to another, can it actually follow that along and see how that happens and how long that latency is? And similarly, if we're running modern environments, if we're running Docker or Kubernetes, things that when a user hits, it might run part of their request and then it might die and be picked up by another container or another system, can our, our tracing actually manage to follow that? And then finally, long-lived. So uh, long-lived for APM, traditionally we don't keep things around too long because you just need to see the, the correlation between the code that you deploy and the code that, uh, or the performance of your application or your system. Although if you can keep things around for longer, it's largely interesting to see your application performance over time. Uh, performance changes when you change code are usually not huge or significant. Uh, but over time they can build up. So if you do keep things around, that's an interesting piece of data that you can get. So again, let's do some examples. There aren't too many uh, APM examples in the open source world, 
particularly for PHP, there is this interesting GitHub project that I found, PHP APM. So it is an open source PHP based APM. Uh, there's also a project called Open Tracing. Uh, the website is opentracing.io. The, the notion here is it's part of, I believe, the Linux Foundation, but they're trying to set up a standard for how we do APM or how we trace code so that you can essentially not have to build all the clients yourself and you can interchange the monitoring tools that you use. Uh, Zipkin is an interesting one. There's no PHP support yet. They're one of the leaders. Uh, Lightstep is also one. They list PHP. It's in early access right now, so you have to request access. Other things, though, that are interesting, uh, not really monitoring, but can be, XHProf. I think a lot of us are familiar with XHProf as a profiler, uh, but there is a XHProf sampling module. So you potentially could try to set up your own APM with XHProf, have it run sampling on real world hits on your sites. Uh, popular services here, New Relic's the big one. I think we've all heard of New Relic. This is their bread and butter. Uh, at Datadog, we did release an APM. We don't have official PHP support, but the community uh, decided to do that. So some guy spent a weekend and wrote uh, an integration and published it on Twitter uh, the other day. So I haven't played with that. I don't know how well it works, but definitely if you do use Datadog, give that a try. Uh, I, I have mentioned profiling a few times, and so this is often one of the things that people get confused about with APM. What's, what's APM versus profiling, or sometimes tracing versus profiling? Profiling isn't monitoring. Um, it largely isn't run on production applications. Uh, the way that I like to think of profiling is similar to automated testing. When we write code, we run it, we commit it, and we run it through some automated testing like unit tests or behavior tests. And then we confirm that it's okay. And largely, this is where profiling really shines. Um, you never get a hit on your performance from real world users because they're never seeing it. But it has this great ability to, when you check in code, hopefully you can hook up with a profiling system that will just automatically run. And it gives you a baseline for how your code should act. Uh, and oftentimes, it can help you find bugs and things like that. On the open source side, XHProf, again, this is where that's really, uh, really well known. Uh, Blackfire.io, who I think they just walked in the back there. Uh, they have a booth downstairs, so you should check them out. They also have a, a really great book um, that uh, explains a lot of how, how profiling works and, and what you should consider there when you're thinking of profiling versus APM. So that covered two of our, our portions of the spectrum. Let's move on up into performance monitoring or the client side. And there's really two types here, uh, real users and synthetics. Uh, and a lot of people are wondering why you should use both. And they actually work really, really well together, which is why I've got Fry and Bender up there. So when you're thinking of real uh, user monitoring, you really want those real user experience, real world experiences. You want to start to measure how people are actually using your website and generating metrics from that. Uh, because we all, when we build applications, we have these assumptions on how people will interact. And often those assumptions, more often than not, they're wrong. People use their applications in really strange ways that we always call edge cases, but they're usually not. So getting those real world experiences is really critical in testing the performance of your application. But more than that, when we're using real users, we get a diversity of testing. Because when we test, we all have our development environments. We have, you know, most of us are running really great souped up uh, laptops with as much memory as we can, so performance isn't an issue. Versus the test in the real world where we have, you know, someone that's in a third world country on a really poor connection that's using, you know, not really a smartphone, like a semi-smartphone. Um, how does that work? So we can start to get a lot of interesting things from real users around the world, different types of connections, different types of browsers. And this feeds back into creating synthetic tests, synthetic tests being things that aren't real users, so essentially robots, scripts that we can write uh, that will actually run uh, preset actions for us. So the great thing about synthetics is they're independent of your user activity. They still hit your production sites, but you don't have to worry about users actually coming on. Um, and the great thing about robots is they can often test things that real users can't, or they can help test things that you don't have enough real users testing. So if you're thinking of things like accessibility, 
well, how many, you know, depending on what you are running, how many blind users do you have? Maybe you want to bulk that up and start to test things from the synthetic side that you don't have enough users testing on the real world side. So if we think about our four good qualities of metrics, um, well understood, are we well understood? Uh, with synthetics, that means do we understand what's being measured and can we easily update? On the RUM side, that means can we easily see uh, user sessions, interactions, make sense of what users are actually doing. Sufficiently granular. So for both of these, again, you're going to have metrics that are in seconds or sometimes milliseconds, uh, often milliseconds for the front end. But how frequently are tests running on the synthetic side? And do we have synthetics on all parts of the system? And then on RUM, the RUM side, is there low overhead? So similar to what we're thinking about for APM, we're impacting real users. We don't want to make the, the performance of what they're seeing uh, degrade enough that they, we start to drive them away. Tagged and filterable, with synthetics, they're robots. So again, we want to start to try to use the, the real user information that we've collected to improve uh, what we're doing on our synthetic side. So can we make synthetic tests that are also geographically distributed? Can we make synthetic tests that are using different connections and using different browsers? Or are we just running from one server running Selenium on an old version of Firefox? Right? Those are two very different things. With the RUM side, can we extract that, that data from them? So can we know with our real user monitoring where they're coming from and can we gather the information about their browser and their connection? And then finally for long-lived, for both of these we really want to see trends. We want to see the trends in how our users are interacting with our applications and our sites. Uh, for real user monitoring, it's a lot of the real user monitoring services out there have started to correlate against business metrics, which is really, really handy. Uh, being able to see how fast something is to tying that into some sort of you know, e-commerce system and seeing how many people buy things because things are faster. On the open source side, there's not a whole lot here, which is really sad. There, there isn't any really synthetic testing out there uh, or true synthetic testing, I, so that's why I didn't put it up here. There's a lot of load testing, so when we think of things like that, we're thinking of, uh, for example, a pan Apache Bench, uh, which will just hit your site and just as if it's up or down, but very few things will actually run through and do a, a whole host of tests. On the RUM side, Boomerang is really the main one that's out there. Boomerang was started by Yahoo. Uh, ya the team that started it ended up going to Sosta, so they ended up running it. Um, again, I'm not a Datadog infomercial, but if you do run Datadog and you want to integrate Boomerang, this guy actually did it, and it's pretty cool and also a little crazy. Um, but yeah, that's worth checking out. Yeah. Uh, let's do questions at the end, just to ensure that we have enough time. Uh, so, not monitoring, but maybe, so things like SiteSpeed.io and ShowSlow are really useful for actually starting to gauge your front end performance. They're not actually monitoring because they're not going to be running all the time or sending you alerts. Popular services in this category are SpeedCurve, CatchPoint, Pingdom, those are all really popular. Uh, I've got two more sections that aren't actually um, within those three because I did mention there's sort of five sections of monitoring. One is other and specialized. So here really it's just thinking about if you have a spectrum, starting to think of where are those gaps. So for some people this might be things like network. If you're running all of your own systems and you're not hosting somewhere, then you might be running your own networks. So you might consider how you network those things uh, or how you monitor your networks. Other things would be things like security monitoring. So there are security monitoring solutions out there that essentially will monitor your systems to let you know if they think you've been hacked. Configuration monitoring, physical monitoring if you're running your own data center. Uh, specialized, so there, there are monitors out there like RunScope which are specially designed to hit uh, APIs and test your API endpoints. Open source projects in this area. Uh, OpenNMS is a network monitoring project. Uh, OSSEC is a security monitoring project, so those are both really interesting. And then popular services here. AppNeta is like one of the leaders in network monitoring. Tripwire, if you're familiar with it, is they do security monitoring, particularly for services. 
Uh, New Relic infrastructure. So New Relic does APM. They do have an infrastructure product, which is largely configuration monitoring. So they can let you know how all of your servers, like what sort of software they're running. And then finally, logging and other tools. So this is one that comes up a lot for me. Uh, people ask, how does logging play with monitoring? And logging is cool because logging goes all across the spectrum. When we think of the things that we're writing, if we're running, writing apps or writing things that run on the front end, we largely have those emitting logs to like console. But sometimes we have th those emitting logs that are transmitted back. Similarly, we're all familiar with Drupal Watchdog, so we're generating logs on that end. We're running infrastructure, those all generate logs. Logs aren't monitoring, though. Uh, logs are a horrible way to monitor. There's a, a computational overhead to these and a storage overhead. When you think of logging, um, how many of you are developers and you've actually written log statements out to Watchdog or something else? Yeah, like most of you have. And you've written a log and you've made it really long because you wanted all that good info, right? Um, that's the way you write logs. It's the way that we all write logs because we want that useful info. But if you're trying to monitor off of a log, you're trying to pull out that metric, which means what? You're essentially running some sort of regex across a giant string to pull out that information, and then you're doing math on that. You're either averaging it out or you're summing it up. You're doing these things, which so, imagine that over a distributed system. You're now aggregating a bunch of huge amounts of text which you have to store, so that's expensive, but you're also having the computational overhead of pulling the metrics out of your logs. So logs are horrible for monitoring, but logs are amazing for finding that additional context and helping you solve things. Uh, a coworker of mine likes to point out that logs are good for discovering the unknown unknowns. Monitoring's great, you set up dashboards for you, the things you know about, but when something fails that you don't know about, uh, logs are usually really, really useful for that because we all write verbose logs. So really, you want log management tools, not log monitoring tools. Open source projects around this, uh, Elk, the Elk stack, Elk, uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana is super popular. Uh, Graylog is another one if you don't want to go down the Elk stack route. Popular services here would be Splunk. I think most of us have heard of Splunk. Sumo Logic is a great one. Logs.io and Logmatic.io are also fantastic. And then the other tools that kind of fall in this that aren't monitoring but are often considered with monitoring, on-call management tools. So things that actually let you know when something goes wrong. Error tracking tools, so a lot of times this is gathering up the errors from that logging tool and making them easily um, available and starting to track your errors. And then anomaly detection is often mentioned in this. So essentially how do we take our metrics and find interesting anomalies or know about things that we may not be able to see in dashboards. Open source projects for these, um, Cabot and OpenDuty. Uh, OpenDuty is essentially an open source version of PagerDuty. Uh, these are really interesting, but I kind of wonder about the wisdom of this. Uh, the whole point behind something like PagerDuty or VictorOps or ServiceNow, any of these that are alerting you, they're trying to alert you that your system went down, and if you're hosting them yourself, chances are they went down as well. So that's why you want to pay other people to do it. Um, but again, PagerDuty, VictorOps, OpsGenie, ServiceNow, all great services for on-call management. Error tracking, uh, Sentry is an open source project. They also do a paid hosted version. Airbit and Squash.io. Squash.io is an, uh, one that I hadn't found out until recently, but that's from the people that built Square, the credit card processing like iPad thing that you find in stores. And then popular services, Sentry.io. Rollbar, Raygun, uh, Bugsnag, all good ways to start to track your errors and get that information out of them. Uh, anomaly detection, there's even less here. There's some really cool projects, but they're tricky to set up. So Skyline is the one that Etsy came up with. It took their stuff out of, um, I believe it was Graphite, and would try to find anomalies within their data. Uh, it's no longer being maintained, though. Uh, eGADS is an interesting one that's from Yahoo, and Luminal is from uh, LinkedIn. eGADS is, it's interesting, but it doesn't, it, it's not particularly meant, uh, well, eGADS, sorry, let me look at these notes. Oh, eGADS is actually really fantastic. It's written in Java, though, so it's kind of tricky to set up, and it's generic, so you have to start to write your own queries against things. So find a good data scientist and bug them um, if you actually want to run that. 
Luminal is interesting, but it's not particularly meant for real time. And really, if you're thinking about anomaly detection for your metrics, uh, you want that real time to be able to understand what's going on and see those anomalies and get alerts. Other services here, uh, Amazon, if you're running in AWS, has Kinesis. Again, this is a sort of similar to EGADS. Uh, you have to write your own queries for this. So again, find your, your nearest data scientist and bug them. Uh, Azure has machine learning, which it, they say tries to make this easier. I haven't played with machine, their machine learning, so I can't say how good or bad it is. But in short, uh, just to wrap this up, really follow your application spectrum. Start to think of things less of buckets uh, or the teams that are actually running them and start to think of them more as a spectrum of what happens when your users make a request uh, so that you can start to see the, those gaps of what you need. Uh, and again, remember those four qualities of good metrics. So is it well understood? Is it long lived? Uh, is it tagged and filterable? And then is it sufficiently granular? Uh, we do have on our Datadog blog, we have some more information about how to collect the right data. So that would be interesting if you like to read blog stuff. But at this point, questions. And I know there's at least one. There is a mic in the center of the room, and I think they want us to use that. Um, and again, if you, uh, if you think of anything beyond this session, uh, hit me up on Twitter. I'm Git Bisect. I'm not actually Eatings or Preston So, but you should, you should tweet out something if you haven't already just to mess with them. Testing, testing. All right. Um, I think you had said that there weren't that many great tools for simulating users. Is that right? Uh, so synthetic monitoring. Yeah, so synthetic monitoring is essentially monitoring with computers. Having computers pretend that they're real users and constantly running tests or running predefined tests to interact with your site and generating metrics from that. Uh, you, s mm. you could potentially build something with like Behat um, to like run that and test, you know, you would write a story as you would with Behat and it would run and do things. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard within Behat for that to start to get you really accurate measurements in time. Uh, so it would, be, it would be as if with code you were, you were, review, you were almost reviewing the monitoring with, like the code was also reviewing the monitoring itself and producing stats. Yeah, I mean, it's not reviewing the monitoring so much as, uh, so example, if you were to try to do this in Behat, um, you would have some sort of uh, Behat story that was like, as a user, when I go to the home page and I click on this button to log in and I enter this login credential, I should see my user profile page. Um, yeah. An actual synthetic monitoring tool would actually measure the time distance between how long did it take for the site to load. When the site loaded, how long did it take for uh, the button, the login button to appear? How long did it yeah. take for um, after I entered the, the login credentials for you know, things to happen? Um, mm -hmm. And you know, largely, Behat wasn't designed for that. Um, right. So you could put in some timers, but because Behat wasn't designed for that, uh, you, you will get some variability behind how long it takes each run that may not be variability in your systems. Right, so tools for, tools for simulating the actions are, are out there, but tools for doing something with for that doing simulation it as don't. And, and getting yeah. metrics from them aren't as developed yet. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Any other questions? No? I know that was kind of a barrage of like, here's a lot of things, and you should monitor them all. So I'm sure all of you have, are using some of those monitoring tools, but you might be missing others. So consider, consider what you're missing. Cool, well, if there are no other questions, again, hit me up on Twitter or via email. Happy to answer your questions, and I'll hang out up front here um, for a while in case you do have questions. Thanks for coming.
that? Yeah, that's my primary monitor. I have a, a How many do you use the commands? Oh, uh, I don't very often because. <laughs> well, me neither. Yeah. Oh, you know when I could have used it though. Uh, the very first time that I crashed something at Datadog. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. So I, I had committed. Uh, I had committed like a minor like documentation change, um, and pushed it to. So I didn't crash the main data dog. Or did I? No, yeah, I crashed staging essentially. Oh, okay. Um, but like staging is always tricky because you have a bunch of people committing to staging, um, and so you have essentially like a race condition. And I was going into a meeting. Away before I ever 